All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. And today we're going to be talking about understanding credit and credit reports. And first and foremost, I would like to welcome you to the Sound Living Wellness Symposium. And my name is Scott Davis, and I am a financial counselor with the Department of Personnel and Family Readiness and part of the financial readiness program here on Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, first, we want to thank you for attending and hopefully we'll gain some knowledge today that will help you out in the future. And hopefully if you're a service member and uh, take this knowledge that you gain today and uh, relay it to your other service members and it is a great wealth of knowledge. Uh, want to just point out our two locations. Uh, bottom left hand side, you'll notice that we have our main location is going to be Waller Hall. We have seven accredited counselors over here and we're open Monday through Friday, 745 to 1600 and we're open on Donzas and closed on federal holidays. Uh, we do have one location on McCord and that is Building 100, the castle and we have one counselor there and that is all OK and on the last slide, just so you know, I'll have the contact phone number and the website you can go to that you'll be able to uh, schedule an appointment if you want to. This will be our agenda. We're going to talk about what is it, what credit is, the types, the how to establish credit, the three C's, credit reports and scores, the impact of using credit, uh, how to use it wisely and protecting our credit during COVID-19. And then after that, we'll open it, we'll open it up for a Q&A. If for some reason you do have a question, OK, and. There's no. Wrong question, just so you know, it's for the benefit of everyone. Uh, in fact, there's good questions yesterday and it did assist them in being able to do those things. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And what is credit? Credit is the measure of trust one party has in another party's ability to receive some kind of resource now and pay for it at, at a designated point in the future. And in most cases, that means a person has a relationship to his or her bank and banks issue the vast majority of credit. Acting as a third party, when the person uses the credit uh, uses the credit as money to make a transaction. Now credit spent in this way incurs a debt, of course, which must be paid off within a designated time or it will accrue interest and other penalties or fees. Credit is part of your financial power and it's going to help you get the things you need now, like a loan for a car or a credit card based on your promise to pay later. Working to improve your credit helps you helps ensure you'll qualify for loans when you need them. The types of credit. There are many types and the two most common types are going to be the two first two listed from left to right and that's going to be your revolving credit installment credit. Open credit, it's the least common of all and I will explain that one as well. Revolving credit. Revolving credit is a line of credit you can keep using after paying it off. You can make purchases with it as long as the balance stays under the credit limit, which can change over uh, time and credit cards are the most common type of revolving credit. Examples, credit cards, personal lines of credit, home equity lines of credit. In credit cards, more than just plastic, credit cards give you the flexibility of making purchases, transferring high interest rate balances and borrowing cash to help meet your financial needs. Personal lines of credit that allows you to borrow money as needed up to an assigned credit line, just like a credit card. Unlike unsecured personal loans, personal lines of credit don't issue funds in one lump sum payment. Instead, you have access to a line of credit which may be accessible by check or a bank transfer. Home equity lines of credit. A HELOC is a revolving line of credit that allows you to borrow against the equity you have in your home. Proceed with caution 
because HELOCs require you to use your home as collateral. This type of loan is often used by people who need to make significant home improvements. Now let's talk about installment credit. Installment credit or loan is basically a set amount of money loaned to you to use for a specific purpose. Installment credit comes in the form of a loan with a fixed loan amount, fixed payments, and an established repayment schedule. Now, unlike revolving credit, installment credit gives you an exact time frame to pay off what you borrow, generally over a period of months to more than uh, five or 10 years, or possibly all the way up for 30 year fixed. In addition, you don't have access to available credit like you would with a credit card. You borrow a lump sum, receiving the total amount of the loan all at once. And then common examples, of course, of installment loans are student loans, auto loans, and home loans. Open credit. Now this type of credit contains elements of both installment and revolving credit. With open credit, the amount due is usually different each billing cycle, and that amount is typically due in full. A utilities account, gas, electric, water, those are good examples of open credit. The amount you owe each month will vary depending on how much you of uh, the commodity you use and the entire balance is expected to be paid. Now charge cards are another example of open credit. Unlike a credit card, which is which has a set credit limit, charge cards do not have a preset limit. This doesn't mean they have no limit at all, just that the limit may fluctuate frequently over time, depending on your spending patterns, your payment history, credit score, and other factors. And of course, credit card limits can change as well, such as when you receive a credit line increase, but typically much less frequent much less frequently with a charge card. The other main difference between a credit and charge uh, charge card is that you are expected to pay off the entire balance of a charge card each billing cycle. If you don't expect to be hit with significant fees or to even have your account closed if it happens too often. American Express, probably the best known charge card. Some department stores and gas stations issue charge cards as well although credit cards are much more the norm these days with both. How to establish credit. Apply for a credit card. Depending on if you have credit or not, depends on if you will be approved or not. It's never too early or too late to build up a good credit. How do you, how do you prove to lenders that you're a responsible borrower? And that's by utilizing credit. A secured credit card, is a type of credit card that is backed by a cash deposit, which serves as collateral should you default on your payments. The deposit side, the deposit aside, secured credit cards function like any credit card. Consumers typically obtain secured credit cards to improve their credit scores or establish a credit history. This is usually done with your current banking institution since you all since you have already established a checking account and possibly a savings account. Now pick your banking institutions very wisely. You want someone you can stay with for the long haul, especially if you move a lot and being in the military, make sure you pick one that is in most of your locations. Paying your bills on time, you should also pay those on time as well. That's including rent and utilities. If you sign a monthly service contract with a business such as a gym, and you want to end it early, be sure to follow the rules established in that contract. Don't just stop paying the monthly fee. The business will report you to the credit agencies for breach of contract. Another credit building method is to get a savings secured loan from your credit union or bank and pay it off over several months. Credit unions and banks will give a loan up to the amount of money, money in a related savings or share account. The money, is the money in the savings account is going to be frozen until some or all of the loan is paid off. Since the financial institutions knows it will get its money even if you default, the interest rate on the loan is normally very low. In a way, you're paying a tiny fee to borrow your own money, but the extra few dollars are worth paying to establish your credit. 
A fourth method is to get a credit card with a local store or a gas station. Start with just one card and make small purchases that you can pay off each month. And it might take months, but with consistent application of these four methods, you can be off to a great start credit wise. And the key thing is paying off your statement balance in full every single month. The three C's of credit. The credit score is a measure of factors that may affect your ability to repay credit. It's a complex formula that takes into account how you've repaid previous loans, any outstanding debt you currently have, and your current salary. A credit score is dynamic. It can change positively or negatively, depending upon how much debt you accrue and how you manage your bills. The factors that determine your credit score are called the three C's of credit. That's character, capital, and capacity. These are areas a creditor looks at prior to making a decision about whether to take you on as a borrower. Character. From your credit history, the lender attempts to determine if you possess the honesty and reliability to repay the debt. In pursuit of that assessment, they might ask the following questions. Have you used credit before? Are you paying your bills on time? Of the things that are already on your credit report, are they good? Can you provide any character references? How long have you lived at your current address? And how long have you been at your present job? These are all things that are going to establish your credit or character. Capital. The lender will want to know if you have any valuable assets such as real estate, personal property, like an automobile or savings and investments that could be used to repay credit debts if income is unavailable. And they're going to ask these questions. What property do you own that you can that you have that can secure the loan? Do you have a savings account? And do you have any investments to use as collateral? And of course, when they're asking if you have a savings account and if you have any investments to use as collateral, they're, they're they are going to want to know uh, the approximate amounts that you have in those accounts. Capacity. A credit report is a detailed account. That, hold on just a second. And then capacity. This refers to your ability to repay the debt. The lender will look to see if you have been working regularly in an occupation that is likely to provide enough income to support your credit use. The following questions will be uh, will assist the lender to determine this. Do you have a steady job? And if so, what's your salary? How many other loan payments do you have? What are your current living expenses? What are your current debts? And how many dependents do you have? All right, making sure I'm on the right one. Credit report. A credit report is a detailed account of the credit, employment, and residence history and of an of an individual. Credit reports also list any judgments, tax liens, bankruptcies, or similar matters of public record entered against an individual. Prospective lenders use credit reports to help to determine a person's credit worthiness. Potential employers, landlords, and insurance companies will often pull a credit report to perform a background or security clearance check. And just so you know, those potential employers, those landlords and insurance companies when they pull that credit report, it is not a hard hit. It is a soft pull because you're not trying to gain financing from them. When you are trying to gain financing, then you are actually it's going to be a hard pull. It's going to be a hard hit on your credit report. There are three major credit reporting companies, Equifax, Experian and TransUnion. They have their own databases and they do not share their information with each other. You should review your credit report at least once every year to make sure the information is correct and up to date and that you haven't become a victim of erroneous reporting or identity theft, both of which can hurt you and can hurt you and your credit. And with that being said, of course, right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
a lot of people are idle. Idle hands do the devil's work. OK, so they have a lot of times on their hands and a lot of the identity theft is occurring. Now, federal law allows every American with a credit history to get one free credit report each year from the three big companies, and you can get those free reports at annualcreditreport.com. And just so you know, right now during COVID, also you can actually pull each credit report once a week from annualcreditreport.com until the end of April. OK, I'll say that again until the end of April. You can actually check your credit report from each of the three agencies from annualcreditreport.com once a week. And at the end of the briefing, I'm going to uh, show a different screen and I'm going to show active duty personnel actually some uh, good information about getting their uh, free credit report as well through each Equifax, Experian and TransUnion. What are the components of the credit report? Now, granted, the agency for the credit reporting agency formats their reports differently. They all contain similar categories of information. Identifying information, that's going to be your name, address, social security number, your date of birth, previous addresses, home ownership, and employment information. Now, these factors are not used in credit scoring. It's also going to have your payment history, and these are your credit accounts you have with different creditors. They report the type of account, which is either a bank card, auto loan, mortgage, student loan, the date you open the account, your credit limit or loan amount, the account balance, and your payment history. And this section is sometimes referred to as trade lines. Credit inquiries, when you apply for a loan, you authorize your lender to ask for a copy of your credit report. The inquiry section contains a list of everyone who accessed your credit report within the last two years. The report you see lists both voluntary inquiries, which are spurred by your own request for credit, and involuntary inquiries. The involuntary inquiries, such as when lenders order to order your report uh, so as to make sure you are pre-approved uh, for a credit card that you usually receive in the mail. And just so you know, those involuntary inquiries are not hard pulls on your credit report and do not harm your credit score. Public record items. Credit reporting agencies also collect for public record information from state and county courts and information on overdue debt from collection agencies. And public record information includes bankruptcies, foreclosures, suits, wage attachments, liens and judgments. Now let's talk about the PII. Each of your credit reports will contain the following basic pieces of biographical information. As I said before, it's going to be your name, date of birth, current and past addresses, social security number. It's unlikely that this information will contain errors, but in some cases you may need to notify a credit bureau that you have moved or found a new job. This will ensure that your current income levels are recognized and that you do not miss any important correspondence. Also, at sometimes you may see three or four different names being reported to the credit agencies. Have that corrected according to the name either on your ID or on your birth certificate and have the other names removed. Credit history. Credit history, and this is your trade line, OK? Your credit reports contain the following information for each account that you've opened with a credit card company, bank, or other creditor in the last few years. Date of account opening and closing if it applies. Credit limit or the loan amount. Monthly balance as of each statement date, and contrary to what many people believe, Credit reports do not list information about individual purchases or other transactions. Monthly payment history. That indicates whether or not minimum payments were made on time and credit reports do not list your exact payment amount. OK. Consumers often wonder how creditors and credit bureaus track their everyday spending if they never used credit cards to make purchases and therefore never have a balance listed on their credit reports. 
And that's a fair question. And their answer is they can't. There's simply no way for a creditor to determine how much you spend in cash and major credit reports don't include information about debit based plastic. That's not necessarily an issue though, as creditors simply want to see this. Uh, want to see that you're using the credit made available to you in a responsible fashion. Not tapping into this available spending power fits that bill, which means if you don't carry a balance on your credit cards, your accounts are still reported at, to the credit bureaus as being in good standing every month. With that said, it's important to note that closed or inactive accounts that have been paid as agreed may remain in your file indefinitely, but in most cases, will be removed 10 years after the date of last activity and accounts not paid as agreed will be removed after seven years. And finally, please keep in mind that the presence of accounts that you did not personally open could indicate fraud. Of course, fraudsters are often often able to open financial accounts under other people's names with some basic information such as their social security number. It's imperative that you notify the credit bureaus and your bank upon discovering any such account as unpaid balances could could damage your credit and be quite difficult to sort out if it's too much or too much time has passed. Credit inquiries. An inquiry is basically recorded whenever your credit report is pulled, viewed by another party such as a lender, credit card company, service provider, landlord, or insurer. Credit inquiries remain on your credit report for up to two years and each can temporarily and each can temporarily result in a slight dip in your overall credit standing. And again, that's only going to be those uh, credit pools that are for when you're trying to gain financing. If you're going to try to purchase a car and they pull your credit report, that's going to be a hard pull. If you're going to uh, rent an apartment and they pull your credit uh, credit report, that is not a hard pull. That's not going to hurt your credit score. If you wish, you can opt out from allowing companies to look at your credit report without your permission, and this will simply remove your name and contact information from the list that credit bureaus sell banks so that they can send people pre-approved credit card offers. So if you take your name off the list, you'll Quit getting all those bank card offers in the mail. Public records. There are three main types of public records that can be included in credit reports. Each has a detrimental impact on your credit standing and may remain for up to 10 years. Bankruptcies. Chapter 7, 11, and 13 bankruptcies can be listed on your credit reports. The length of time they will remain there and the damage done to your credit standing depends on the type of bankruptcy in question and whether or not you adhere to the terms of that bankruptcy. Other than that, and I'm going to quote Dr. Deborah Thorne here, she's an associate professor of finance at Ohio University. There is no way to me mediate how much a bankrupt bankruptcy affects your credit score. It is what it is, regardless of the chapter filed. Tax liens. Now, courts often attach a notice known as a lien to your property records in order to block the sale of that property until unpaid debts, usually unpaid taxes, are addressed. Civil judgments. If a court finds that you owe another party money, and that could be child support, something of that nature, this will re be reflected on your credit report. The personal statement. When it comes to your credit report, you have the right to add a personal statement, and this statement can be up to 100 words long and gives you the opportunity to explain information in your file. Now you can address any aspect of your credit file, including multiple items. There are many possible uses for this 100 word statement. Explaining the reasons for filing that bankruptcy. Now, part of the process of recovering from bankruptcy should be including a personal statement explaining your situation. If you can let creditors know that your bankruptcy resulted from a divorce, uh, medical issues, or other unexpected tragedies, it might help you with some lenders and credit granters down the road. Clarifying any inaccuracies. 
if there is a mistake in your report that you are having trouble getting updated, you can set the record straight by filling out a personal statement or calling attention to a dispute. If an account you are disputing is listed by a creditor as past due or a collection agency is trying to make you pay an account that isn't yours, this personal statement allows you to explain that you are disputing the debt while you are working to have it removed from your report. Adding information about negative items. If you have an account that has a late or missed payments, you can explain why. It won't help your score, but it might reassure an underwriter that you are not likely to default again in the future. Explaining a fraud alert more fully. If you are the victim of identity theft or a fraud alert, or if you are uh, the victim of a identity theft, a fraud alert is going to be placed on your file. The personal statement allows you to explain the situation more fully and point out which accounts were affected by the ID theft. And be aware that including a personal statement in your credit report won't always be help you. Many, credit, many creditors simply don't read them at all. Some let computers evaluate credit reports for them. And since the personal statement cannot improve your credit score, it won't have an impact in most cases. But some lenders, however, will personally evaluate applicants and they don't limit themselves to just checking your credit score. In these cases, a well-written personal statement might help you get approval. And you should also consider the other readers besides creditors when drafting 100 of uh, the personal statement. Potential landlords, insurers, and employers, and, and employers may access your report as well. The personal statement might not help you get credit, but it can assuage the potential employer who is reviewing your report before deciding to offer you a job. And that means you should be careful about what personal information you include in your statement, as well as the tone and language of what you write. And if, of course, if it's a medical situation, you may not want to go into detail about the personal medical situation. The FICO score. And I like to point out here score uh, is kind of a misnomer. It's scores. OK, uh, there's quite a few FICO scores out there uh, and you may have heard of a credit score, which is the numeric figure that uh, creditors use to determine how much credit they can safely offer you and how much interest they should charge for it. And there are several different types of credit scores and most people are familiar with the FICO and which is based on five categories. And each category is weighted in importance as follows. 35% of your payment history. That right there is the largest percentage of your credit score payment history. Who controls our payment history? We do. We control our own payment history. This is your track record of being able to pay back your debts on time. Late or missed payments hurt your score. Just so you know that later missed payments hurt your score. As soon as it happens, you're going to see a drop in your score. 30% is how much you owe. This component reveals how deeply in debt you are and contributes to determining if you can handle what you owe. If you have high outstanding balances or are nearly maxed out on your credit cards, your score will be negatively affected. A good rule of thumb when it comes to credit cards is not to exceed 30% of the credit limit on a credit card. That being said, if the credit limit's $1,000, 30% of that is 300. You would never want to go above $300 on a balance. Fifteen percent is going to be length of your credit history. And this shows lo how long you've had and used credit. The longer your history of responsible credit management, the better your score will be because lenders have a better opportunity to see your every payment pattern. 10% is types of the credit in use, and this shows the mix of credit types you use, such as credit cards, retail accounts, installment loans, finance company accounts, and mortgage loans. You do not have to have each type of account. Instead, this factor considers the various types of credit you have and whether you use that credit appropriately. For example, if you charged a frivolous purchase like a boat onto a credit card, that would hurt your score. 
but if you've got an installment loan for the purchase of that boat, it's not going to hurt it as bad right away. The last per 10 percent of your credit score is going to be determined from new credit or inquiries into your credit history. This, these suggest that you have or are about to take on more debt. It can be risky to open several credit accounts in a short amount of time, especially if you don't have a long established credit history, because each time you apply for a new line of credit, that application counts as an inquiry or a hard hit. And here's where new credit can be a double edged sword. OK, and if you have one credit card and you've had that credit card for three or four years and you're not really seeing your credit score going up that much and you're utilizing that credit card and you have and you're paying the statement balance off in full every single month. It would probably help your credit score to go out and get another credit card, OK? and utilize that credit card the same way you're utilizing the first one, small purchases and ensuring you pay off your statement balance in full every single month. Now it shows them that you're able to take on more credit and continue to pay it more responsibly. Now, if you have two or three credit cards and they're maxed out or they're way above that 30% we talked about earlier, it's not gonna help your score. In fact, more like it's gonna definitely gonna drop your credit score and more likely you're going to get a high interest rate on that credit card that you're applying for, or you may even be disapproved. Now these are the, going to be the impacts of your credit scores. OK, Kate and Mike, they each just purchased a new car for $12,000. OK, that's the loan amount. Both of them decided to take out a loan with a five year term from their bank. Mike has a credit score of 620. He's given an interest rate of 12% with a monthly payment of 266.93. Kate has a credit score of 760 and is given an interest rate of 3% with a monthly payment of $215.62. Now, at the end of the five years or the five year term, when both Kate and Mike have their loans paid off, Mike, he's going to have paid $4,016. Kate, She's only going to have paid $937.46. Now, this resulted in Mike paying over $16,000 for that same $12,000 car, where Kate, she only paid $12,937 for that same vehicle. Uh, just so you know, we've had uh, quite a few service members coming through lately with very high interest rates on vehicles. Uh, I had a service member come in, um, 26 years old, and when he went to apply for financing at the dealership, they told the service member they had ghost credit, meaning their name is out there, but they have never used a credit card. They've never had a loan. And so pretty much they have no credit score. And when you hear those commercials or those lines from dealerships saying no credit, no problem, it's a huge problem when you see what credit uh, interest rates you're going to get. That service member, uh, one, he had to put down $7,000 uh, towards the purchase of the vehicle, and he was still given a 19.99% interest rate. I had another service member came in, and he purchased a $15,000 car. Total financing of the car was $16,700 with licensing taxes and fees. His interest rate was 24.75%. And over the life of that loan, he would have ended up paying, he's going to end up paying $32,000 unless he gets it refied after a certain period of time to hopefully lower his interest rate. So be wary of your credit score. Okay, no gross credit, you're going to have a high interest rate. That service member, his credit score was in the high 500s. Okay, so therefore, Reason being, that's why you got a 24.75% interest rate. Over on the left hand side, you'll notice these uh, what your credit scores can affect. It can affect your interest rates as demonstrated on the right hand side. It'll actually uh, affect your insurance rates, ability to rent or uh, rent a house or an apartment, employment, loan or credit card approval, and of course, all the way down at the bottom, security clearance. 
Now, just so you know, from OPM, failure or inability to live within one's means, safe failure to failure or inability to live within one's means, satisfy debts and meet financial obligations may indicate poor self-control, lack of judgment or unwillingness to, ab to abide by rules and regulations, all of which can raise questions about an individual's reliability, trustworthiness and ability to protect classified information that directly goes into security clearance. And as you all know, um, if you do hold a security clearance, uh, the Department of Central Adjudication Facility is reviewing credit reports now at random, and it's going to be done at least once a year, if not more. Using your credit wisely. One way to look at using a credit card is basically taking out a loan each purchase you make. Pay pay your credit card balance in full every billing cycle, and that's to avoid paying any interest. As long as you pay the credit, uh, the statement balance in full, you avoid paying interest. I did not know that. I was always, I always assumed that you had to carry a balance on a credit card to increase your credit score. That's not true. Use your credit score, or use your credit card, get your statement, pay your statement balance off in full before the due date. That's how you're going to increase your credit score and make sure when you utilize that credit card, it's less than 30% of the credit limit. Make all your payments on time every time. Make sure you're paying more than just the minimum. If you're going to carry a balance on your credit card, pay more than the minimum. I always pay more than the minimum because it's going to take you forever to pay that credit card off. If you're going to be late on a payment or any, uh, anything like that, contact your creditor. They want to hear from you. If you're in the service, they are going to assist you. They love the military. But make sure you contact them, and that's before you're late. Don't take on any monthly payments you can't afford, and don't borrow or charge more than you can afford to pay back. I like to look at this. If you don't have enough money in the bank in checking or savings to cover that purchase, you shouldn't be buying it. Protecting our credit during COVID-19. Again, pay your bills on time, and if you have the means, try to pay them on time to avoid having any delinquencies recorded in your credit reports. Now, unless you have a special arrangement with your creditor, late and missed payments may still get reported to credit bureaus. Again, unless you have a special arrangement with your creditor, late and missed payments may still get reported to the credit bureaus. The best defense against letting that happen is doing what you can to make payments on time. Even if you're only making the minimum payment, the lender requires. Contact your creditors and service providers to see if they can help. Many lenders and service providers are providing relief to people impacted by COVID-19. And if you fear you won't be able to pay a bill, contact your creditor or service provider immediately to see if there are any options that might help such as loan forbearance, it's important to contact them before missing those payments as some relief options may not work retroactively. Now, if you take advantage of a relief option, make sure the agreement you make with your creditor might include protections for your credit score. Make sure to discuss this with your creditor. For help with this, you can check out Experian's, and again, you can Google Experian list of financial non-financial and government institutions offering relief. Monitoring your course, your credit regularly. You got to monitor your uh, credit regularly. Checking your credit can give you peace of mind and can help you see if you, your score has gone up or down. And remember that those credit scores do fluctuate often. So it is your score. So if your score drops, it could recover over time. Experience free credit monitoring service allows you to check your Experian credit report and FICO score regularly to see where you stand. And just so you know, I believe the FICO score that you will be seeing is going to be your Experian FICO 8. Seek financial assistance. OK, you can come talk to us at the financial readiness program. If you feel overwhelmed by the idea of budgeting and paying down your debt, or you may want to learn more about credit and how to build it the right way. You can also consider contacting a credit counseling agency that can help you uh, devise a plan to repay your debts. 
There's nonprofit credit counselors that can help you come up with a plan to manage your debts as well. You can contact the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. And again, that's the National Foundation for Credit Counseling to find a reputable counselor near you. I'm not sure what happened there, but let me go back and. And as I said at the very beginning, I would tell you how you would be able to make an appointment with us. We have two locations again on JBLM. Of course, our primary location being JBLM here at Waller Hall, and we have the one location on the castle, which we only have one counselor over there. The easiest way to schedule an appointment with us is jblmfrp.timetap.com. And if you have trouble getting through it online, you can always give us a call at 253-967-1453, and we'd be glad to help you and assist you in scheduling an appointment. And these are the areas on the right hand side of this slide that we cover and we are the subject matter experts on JBLM uh, concerning the thrift savings plan and the BRS. And at this time, do I have any questions and please uh, we do, the chat is unavailable for those that are in. That are guests, so if we could. Let's go ahead and open mics if you do have a question. And actually, and I'm, what I'm going to do is also on active duty service members, just so you know, according to the 2018 Fair Credit Reporting Act, all active duty service members have access to the three credit reports from TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian for free, but you have to go to each one to sign up for it. And I'm going to bring that up really quick. In fact, let me go to this website and where you're going to access this uh, handout is at financialfrontline.org financialfrontline.org And financialfrontline.org is for active duty military personnel. And again, uh, it definitely covers all the milestones, okay, that you're going to see throughout your military career. Uh, it has educational videos, uh, financial counselors, calculators, a self assessment tool, and future soldier training for those soldiers that may, or the, for those personnel that may want to join the military. But the easiest way to find the credit monitoring handout is go to milestones. PCS. And here's a good overview of all videos uh, talking about PCS and things about nature, but the main one I'm wanting to point out is free credit monitoring. And here, if you go to this one and you go to the URLs, Equifax, TransUnion and Experian, you can sign up for each one of those. And if you look, these are the services you're going to be getting from the credit servicing agencies. Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax and TransUnion, you get $25,000 in ID theft insurance. For free, just for because you're on active duty, OK? You get daily fraud alerts, you can uh, lock your credit. That means no one can access it. So this is a great uh, tool for active duty soldiers, especially if they're going to be going to the field for a long time for 30 days, they can lock their credit or if they get deployed, this will be a great thing for them to utilize to lock their credit to ensure nothing happens while they're gone. Another website that is great for uh, military spouses, and if you haven't heard about it, is millspousemoneymission.org. Another one. This is another great wealth of knowledge uh, for, for resources for financial literacy. If you want to increase your financial literacy, come to money, millspousemoneymission.org. Uh, it goes through getting started and through the different money readies, okay? Overview and talks about goal setting, creating a budget, understanding credit, and managing debt, ensuring your family, saving, investing, protecting your family, 
major purchases, funding college for children, planning to retire, investing wisely, planning your estate, and measuring progress. Okay. It even has one for mill kids. Okay. If you want to start teaching your kids about personal finance, I will tell you, I wish I'd learned more about personal finances. And one of my uh, attendees yesterday said the same thing. Uh, you know, I wish I would have known at a young age what I know now. And I hope everyone here actually, you know, talks to their children about money issues, okay, about finances, because what you teach them, they're going to be able to take with them for the rest of their life. And at this time, do I have any questions? We have about 15 minutes for any questions that you may have. Hey, Mr. Davis, this is uh, Brandon Mino. I got a question. Where is this uh, video going to be um, posted for access? I will tell you, sir, I do not know the answer to that question. But with that being said, <laughs> I will send you an email because I definitely have your email address okay. uh, and let you know exactly where it's going to be posted. OK, really appreciate it. Great class. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. You're on mute. Yeah, I'm I'm good. I just <clears throat> that was my oh, only no. question. Really oh. appreciate uh, the class. Hi, sorry. Now it's Cheryl. I think you can hear me. I hope. Um, yes, I can, ma'am. When you send that um, link out to the presentation, can you also include all the links that you've shared with us at the end? Because we could just see your screen, which said Q and A on it, and we weren't able to see the websites you were referencing. Oh, really? Hold yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the case for all these uh, symposiums is the chat box. Um, does it work for guests? Correct. Yeah, it doesn't work for us either, so I don't think anybody can see it. OK, I'm going to stop sharing that screen and actually, you know what, ma'am? I am going to share this screen because I can do that. Share screen. It's going to give me my options. And you should be able to see that screen now, correct, ma'am? Yes. OK, yeah, this is Mill Spouse Money Mission. And like I said, this is a great wealth of knowledge. And I will tell you when it comes to uh, the presentation of the content, I like it better. And I'm sorry for the Army side, but I like this one better just for the simple fact it's very clear and it, you know, it's easy to understand. And like it, and this again, this is the mill spouse money mission. And for you, sir, and I'm going to go to the one next to it. This is the handout I was talking about, and this is on financialfrontline.org. And in fact, you know what? I'm going to go all the way back through how I got there. Uh, I clicked on PCS, or actually, I clicked on milestones, and it brought me down to PCS. And once it got there, it brought me here, sir. And I was scrolled all the way down to the bottom and right here was free credit monitoring and you download that and post it in your uh, unit area because this is a great uh, service for active duty members and a lot of people haven't heard about this. And just so you know, I am putting this out every in processing brief that I uh, have with E4s and belows and with officers. What is it? The, the website securing the financial frontline? No, it's financialfrontline.org. Oh, okay. And again, and with that, sir, all personnel or service members should be getting counseled whenever they reach a milestone, whether it's PCS, promotion, pre deployment, post deployment. And they should be getting counseled financially, you know, for these uh, different touch points. And if you notice, you got a PCS. Uh, vesting in the TSP, continuation pay, marriage, first child, and unfortunately, even divorce. Okay. And so when you click on PCS, it, you have a counselor checklist and a counselee or the counselee's checklist, basically the soldier checklist. And it gives you the information right there that you need to go over with the soldier. You can fill it out and they can attach that to their 4856. And for the mill spouse, for the Military spouses, mill spouse money mission is like I said, 
I like the content on talking about budgeting and things of that nature, along with the money ready. And that's getting started. They have blogs, they have different resources, military relief societies. And like I said, this is a great wealth of knowledge to increase your financial literacy. I wish these were to, were available when I joined the military uh, a long, long time ago. Um, uh, but hey, technology has came around a long way and I'm just thankful that we have it now uh, for our spouses and for our service members. And Cheryl, just so you know, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to get with uh, Miss Thomas with our marketing and see if we can't get this added to the DPFR. Uh, it's going to be the Facebook uh, web page for the financial readiness program, and that way those links will be right there for you. And I'll see if I can't get it added to the uh, digital swag bag. Yeah, it would be great in the digital swag bag. I know they already speak to this at the newcomers brief, um, but it's such a great resource, especially with the mill kids piece that I want to make sure it gets far and wide. Oh, yes, ma'am. I absolutely and I can't agree with you more. And this is this will just give you an idea about the mill kids. That's tips and tools to raise financially fit kids and it talks about their values and habits. And, you know, one of the things that I learned in the process of getting my certification it is about behavior and it and your how you control your finances throughout your life really depends on how you were raised and i money was not discussed in my home it never was and i mean a little bit about myself i uh, lost my father when i was very young and raised by a single parent and that's why it was never talked about all I know is there was food on the table, a roof on my head, and clothes on my back. And I was able to get back and forth to sports whenever need be. So when I joined the military, I didn't know. I started getting that paycheck, and I'm like, okay, I've got a lot of money. I'm rich. I'm, I'm going to be spending my money, okay? And it took about two, three years before I really learned how. And, of course, when I joined the military, there were no cell phones, no Internet, no computers, nothing like that. So I really didn't have a lot of... Uh, expenses but for some reason i didn't have a lot of money in savings because i didn't plan things out and that's one of the things we are really uh, concentrating on is letting all soldiers know whether you're single or married you need to be budgeting your money on a monthly basis and making sure you're living below your means not above it <laughs> 